Um, welcome to the third MPG primer session. Um, my name is Gina Peloso. I am currently at the um, Boston University School of Public Health um, in the Biostat department there. But by about two years ago, I was a Brody and I worked in Dr. Sekar Katharizan's lab and um, did genetic analyses on plasma lipids and um, cardiovascular disease. And um, I was here for about five years, so I'm glad to be back. Um, today we're gonna talk about GWAS and secondary analyses of GWA results. And if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to interrupt me and we can talk further about anything. So, the goal of genome-wide association studies is to associate phenotypic variation with genotypic markers across the genome. And typically, these genotypic markers are single nucleotide polymorphisms. Um, so um, places in the genome where a single base pair is changed by a single nucleotide. Um, and GWAS are particularly useful for um, complex traits so traits that have both a genetic and environmental component, and that genetic component is based on many genetic factors, um, not just a single um, mutation that causes the disease. Um, and so uh, GWAS are really getting at the common disease, common variant hypothesis. Um, here is a um, plot from uh, a review in a uh, Nature Review Genetics um, from 2008. Um, and um, along the uh, y-axis, or the x-axis here, you have the frequency of a variant. And then along the y-axis, you have the penetrance, or the um, effect size of a variant. And Variants that are affecting Mendelian diseases here are often um, very rare in frequency and have large effects. But what we're getting at with GWAS are over on the right side of the plot here that are more common variants that have uh, a lower effect size on your uh, phenotype of interest. And as GWAS have progressed over the years, we have had been able to get at effects um, with lower and lower minor allele frequency through GWAS. So GWAS have been performed for over 10 years now. It started with the HapMap project, where the goal of the HapMap project was um, to catalog the common genetic variation within uh, the human population. And the variants that were, or the SNPs that were found in, from the HapMap project were put on uh, commercial genotyping arrays, and those commercial genotyping arrays were uh, genotyped in many studies to be able to perform um, tests for association with the SNPs on the genotyping array with your outcome of interest. So the goal was to look at this set of genome-wide markers for the association with an outcome of interest. Um, GWAS have been very successful at identifying uh, associations um, between single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs and uh, outcomes. Um, I took this from the GWAS catalog uh, about just uh, two weeks ago, less than that. And the GWAS catalog contains about 3,000 publications and 51,000 unique SNP trait associations. And the number of unique SNP trait associations has actually doubled in sample size since I have, or doubled in size since the, um, when I gave this talk last year in 2016, where there was about 25,000 unique SNP trait associations. So people are still um, being very successful at finding variation um, associated through uh, genome-wide association studies. 
Uh, there are three main steps in performing a genome-wide association study. You have to design your study appropriately to be able to detect these effects. Um, then when you get your data from the arrays and your phenotypes, you need to do appropriate quality control on that data. And then after you have both of those aligned, you can do your analysis. Um, and we'll talk about your primary analysis of doing the GWAS, and then some secondary and follow-up analyses that can be done based on GWA results. So the first thing you want to do when you're designing your study is um, think about what you want your uh, outcome of interest to be. Um, do you want to analyze a dichotomous trait or a continuous trait? Um, and um, importantly, before you actually um, start your GWAS, you need to identify and confirm that you have a uh, genetic component of your trait of interest. Um, so if you do not find a genetic component, if you don't find any heritability in your traits, um, you're probably going to have a difficult time finding genetic variants associated with that trait. Um, but you can do both um, case control studies uh, on a particular disease, or you can look at quantitative traits um, for association to SNPs across the genome. Um, so you may ask, what sample size do I need to detect uh, effects of a certain magnitude? This is a, a pretty old paper. It's from 2015, but it gives us an idea of the type of effects we need. Here along the x-axis is the um, frequency of the, very, uh, the SNP, and then along the y-axis is the sample size needed. And the different lines indicate the different effect sizes and odds ratios that you have, you can detect at certain sample sizes. And so if you have about a 50% uh, frequency SNP and you um, want to detect variants or SNPs that are at least 1.2 um, odds ratios, um, you need approximately 4,500 samples. But in GWAS, what we've um, learned over the last 10 years is we're typically seeing effects in the range of much lower than 1.02. We're seeing effects that are oftentimes in the odds ratio of 1.02 instead of 1.2. And so we need much larger sample sizes to detect those effects. So that could um, knowing what sample size you need to detect certain um, size effects um, will help you design your study to be adequately powered. And um, there are two approaches to doing GWAS. You can do a single study GWAS where you're just looking at one data set and you have a very unique phenotype that you're looking at for association to the SNPs. The other option and what has been commonly done over the past 10 years is doing multi-study GWA results. Um, and this is typical of common collected phenotypes like uh, plasma lipids or uh, BMI or type 2 diabetes, where you have a consortium and multiple groups have contributed results to the um, GWAS and a meta-analysis is done of the study results. And um, doing a multi-study um, GWAS um, often allows you to have larger sample sizes and thus a greater power to detect associations. Um, there are over 40 different genotyping arrays that have been developed over the past uh, 10 years um, from Illumina and Affymetrix. And um, this is important to keep in mind of what genotyping array will be best for your study. So after you've decided on your phenotype, you have gotten your genotype platform and um, gotten the data back from uh, the genotyping, the next step is to perform quality control. And quality control is an essential step in analyzing your data. Um, QC steps need to be taken to remove individuals and, and markers with particularly high error rates. Um, assuming that many individuals have been genotyped, um, removal of a handful of individuals should have really little effect on the power. 
And given the large number of markers that are typically genotyped with arrays, um, removal of a small percentage should not markedly decrease the overall power of um, your study. But one could uh, make the argument that every marker that you remove from a GWAS association study is that you're, you're potentially missing a, um, an association. But hopefully we we'll, can recover some of those markers through imputation. So some common QC metrics that are done are um, doing both sample and uh, SNP QC. For sample QC, we typically look at missingness, um, deviations from heterozygosity, um, looking, um, making sure gender um, based on the genotypes matches the self-reported gender, um, looking for duplicates, cryptic, cryptic relatedness, or unexpected relatedness. Um, if you have family data, you can check for Mendelian errors, and then for uh, population outliers. For SNPQC, we typically look for um, high missingness, deviations from Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, which could indicate um, a stratified SNP or a problem with the genotyping. Um, differential missingness between cases and controls um, can indicate a problem with the genotyping and bias your results um, if you have different missingness between cases and controls. And then you can look at the Mendelian errors if you have family data within the, the SNP as well. So usually QC is done on individuals first and then markers. Um, and this approach uh, prevents markers from being removed um, just because of a small subset of poorly genotyped individuals. And this is because you typically have more markers or SNPs that have been genotyped than you have um, individuals in your study. One thing you have to be conscious of with genome-wide association studies is population structure. So population structure occurs if uh, there are subpopulations in your data that differ re with respect to both the trait distribution and the marker genotype frequencies. And this can create confounding or spurious associations in your results. And this is just a classical confounding case where you have um, your exposure of interest, which is your genetic variation, and you have your outcome, which is your outcome, and you want this relationship, but there is this third factor that is influencing both the exposure and the outcome. And here, that, that third confounder, that third variable that's influencing this relationship is population structure. So this is a, a principal component plot that um, aggregates genetic information across the genome. Um, and here is a PC1 versus PC2, and this shows that you can really separate out uh, Italians from uh, non-Italians. This is a study that is purely European ancestry. And um, you can see that there's actually substructure within this uh, European population um, that can be shown through these principal components. Um, so population stratification can be adjusted for. It's just something you need to um, be aware of. It can be controlled through well-matched study designs. Um, it could also be um, controlled through um, calculating these genetic principal components and adding them as covariates to your um, association models. And then a third approach for uh, controlling for population stratification is using mixed models with a genetic relationship matrix. So here are some um, good references on best pra practices um, for quality control of GWAS association results. So after you QC the data, um, you may have to combine the data, like I said, through meta-analysis with other uh, cohorts that have also collected similar or the same phenotypes. And this helps improve power by increasing your sample size. But there is the problem that different studies typically use different commercial genotyping arrays um, that give you a different set of SNPs on those arrays. So when the studies you use different SNPs, um, the common SNPs may be analyzed together, but that set of common SNPs across all the platforms is typically very small or not ideal.
So you um, want to perform imputation of your, um, your SNPs to a reference panel. So say we have a reference panel in this toy example that has uh, uh, genotypes on many SNPs across the genome. And we have a commercial chip array in our samples here that has a, a mar much sparser um, distribution of SNPs. And so we can use the set of reference haplotypes to infer the genotypes at a loci that are not typed in our own sample, leveraging the LD between um, nearby SNPs. And in which case, in our sample, we can fill in these missing um, SNPs um, based on SNP imputation. Um, the imputation that has been, the imputation panel that has been used um, has um, increased as uh, we've gone over the last 10 years. Um, it started with using the HapMap uh, data, which uh, had about 270 people um, to use as the backbone for um, imputation. And then came along uh, the 1,000 genomes. Um, and 1,000 genomes the, um, was wanted to find uh, SNP variation um, down to approximately a 1% frequency in human populations. And they got up to about 2,700 individuals um, sequenced for, uh, across the genome to find variation across the genome. And then the, the latest imputation panel is the Haplotype Reference Consortium, and they have over uh, 60,000 uh, um, whole genomes used to create the reference haplotypes. Um, and it is uh, the largest sample of uh, haplotypes available for um, imputation. And you can get down to a minor allele count of approximately five for imputation. Uh, so here's, there's many um, imputation software out there to do the imputation. I'm not going to go through any of them specifically, um, but they all basically um, work on a reference panel of uh, haplotypes to impute the missing SNPs into your samples. Um, and they have different uh, algorithms depending on uh, the imputation. Um, you do want to do some post-imputation quality control of your data. Um, when you have a um, measure of quality that's close to one, it indicates that there's good imputation quality. But oftentimes, you need to exclude SNPs that have not been poorly um, imputed. And so if an imputation quality is less than, say, 0.4 or 0.3, um, those SNPs should be excluded prior to analysis. And there's slightly different um, names for the imputation uh, quality dependent on um, what program you use. Um, for example, Mock uses this R square hat, while Impute used um, the proper info um, field to um, indicate their imputation quality. So going back to the example where we have um, two studies that have been um, genotyped on different chips, if we um, want to uh, combine the studies results um, before imputation, really they don't they have very few SNPs in common. But then after um, imputation, it fills in all those missing pieces, and um, all of the SNPs can be um, jointly looked at um, through a meta-analysis. Questions on quality control? Okay. So then we can um, start talking about analysis. So um, in the simplest case, we have a continuous outcome um, of interest, and we're associating that with our SNP. And we can say that um, our independent variable is equal to one if an a, a individual has allele A and zero otherwise. And then we can test for the mean difference between A and not A individuals. So having the A allele versus not having the A allele. And this basically comes down to a two sample t-test. Um, and we're comparing carriers of the allele versus those not carrying the allele. 
Um, when we perform um, GWAS, we typically extend that for quantitative traits to linear regression. So we're, for each marker, looking at the trend in the traits compared to the trend in the genotypes. For dichotomous traits, we can, um, for each marker, compare the allele frequency in cases to the allele frequency in controls. We can do that through chi-square tests, Fisher exact tests, um, trend tests, or logistic regression. And oftentimes, we can um, control for covariates such as age and sex, um, possible population structure through principal components analysis. And then if you have family data, you'll want to control for the fam familial relationships through um, a kinship matrices or a genetic relationship matrices that get at cryptic um, population structure or cryptic structure. So when we perform a test of association, what we're testing is our null hypothesis is that there's no association between SNP i and the outcome so that our beta is equal to zero. Um, and then our alternative uh, hypothesis is that there is an association between the SNP i and the outcome. We're doing this across all the SNPs that we have imputed. And from this, we get um, effect sizes, so either odds ratios or um, beta values. And that indicates how much of an effect does this genotype have on our outcome. We also get estimates of standard error. What is the variability in our effect size? And then what is the significance of the association? So what's our p-value? So what is an appropriate significance level? Well, um, we're doing uh, many tests for association. Um, we're testing 100,000 to over 10 million variants for association with our trait of interest. Um, so we should do a correction on our alpha level for doing so many tests. And so um, the way to correct our alpha level is to allow the family-wise error rate level to be closer to the desired um, 0.05 level. And oftentimes we do this with a Bonferroni correction, which is divide the overall alpha level by the number of comparisons or tests we're doing and compare our p-value to an adjusted um, alpha level of 0.05 divided by the number of tests. Um, for GWAS, um, this alpha level uh, is been um, found to be five times 10 to the negative eighth. And what this does is corrects for an estimated one million independence tests. Um, so a simulation was study was done to determine the number of independent tests for common genetic variation. And it was determined that it was approximately um, one million in the European population. Um, now, if you have a non-European population, this is, um, you probably need a more conservative um, alpha level because you'll have, be testing more variation, independent variation. So when you have multiple studies, there's multiple, um, two approaches, um, when you have multiple studies contributing to your GWAS. Um, one approach is to combine individuals from multiple studies and create one data set that has the, um, the, the genotypes and the phenotypes, and you're going to analyze them all together in a single joint analysis. But oftentimes, it's not feasible to share data across institutions because of patient confidentiality. So a typical approach is to do meta-analysis, where we combined evidence for of associations combined evidence of association across studies. So you're combining test statistics, p-values, and effect sizes um, from your regression GWAS models. Um, inverse variance weighted um, meta-analysis is a, a typical a common approach used in GWAS, and it's often referred to as fixed effects meta-analysis. Um, it is the weighted average of the effect estimates for each study, um, taking the precision of the effect estimate into consideration, so taking the standard error into consideration. So this allows larger studies to be, um, get, are given more weight and so are considered more precise, where smaller studies are typically less precise and given less weight in the meta-analysis. 
And these weights are inversely proportional to the standard error squared. And so here's just the, the math. We have the effect estimates in each of the studies, and we have standard errors in each of the studies. We then can create weights for each of the studies, which is a function of their standard error. And then we can use those to get a pooled effect estimate, uh, a pooled standard error effect estimate. And then we can create a z-score that is um, just the uh, beta over the standard error of the beta, and that's normally distributed under the null hypothesis. So um, here's some references for uh, best practices for uh, meta-analysis and some really great um, reading. Any questions about meta-analysis? So based on doing your GWAS, you're going to get a really large number of results, right? You're going to get up to 10 million or more tests of association. So how do you summarize those tests um, across so many um, SNPs. And there's two um, established approaches that we typically use to first summarize our results, and that's QQ plots and Manhattan plots. So QQ plots um, visualize the overall distribution of p-values from an association study. Um, under the null, um, p-values are expected to follow a uniform distribution. And here we can see um, the the um, expected value of your test statistic, oh, um, and here is your observed value, and um, you expect that it to follow, uh, the associations to follow along the 45 degree line. Here, each point is an individual association, and here you can see that we're, um, the, most of the associate, that everything's falling um, under what would be expected, except for this one that is more significant than expected. And um, this is just because it is a, a true association here. Um, the majority of the points here are right down here in this lower end of uh, the distribution um, with very small um, test statistics. Another we, we um, describe this is through the lambda value, where we take the median of the observed chi-square statistic and divide it by our um, expected chi-square statistic, expected median chi-square statistic. And when that is um, greater than one, that means that there's some inflation in the test statistics. Um, so the QQ plot looks at the overall distribution of test statistics. Um, you can have inflation of test statistics um, for many reasons. It can result in, um, this inflation can result in unaccounted um, uh, systematic differences between cases and controls. It could be due to population structure, um, uncontrolled uh, relatedness, some technical bias um, or poor quality genotypes can cause this inflation or departure from the 45 degree line. And here you can see, this is just a, a simulation, is, but this, sees, this you can see that there's a departure, a systematic departure from the 45 degree line, um, indicating that there's something that has not been adequately controlled in this GWAS. Here's some um, real QQ plots. This is from um, LDL cholesterol. Um, and here um, from the Metabochip uh, paper that was published in 2013. And here is our GWAS. And um, what you see here is we have this, this is where the 45 degree line is all the way down here. And that's because we have a lot of known associations with um, with uh, LDL cholesterol, and that's really um, driving this tail to be um, ha very highly associated. So here I'm plotting the observed minus log 10 p-values um, by the expected minus log 10 p-values. And you can see that there's very significant results here. And um, the black line here is all of the results. And then the, um, 
the green and blue lines are, um, the blue line is the previously known loci are removed from the, um, the set of results. And the green line is that the genome-wide significant loci are removed from the results. And after you remove these um, previously known and, associate, and newly associated um, uh, SNPs, you get a much closer distribution to uh, the 45 degree line um, that you would expect, indicating that these results are pretty well controlled for um, potential uh, problems. Uh, the other way we summarize the results across the whole genome is through Manhattan plots. Um, and here is uh, the example also from LDL cholesterol. Each point here is also an association where you have along the x-axis uh, the position in the genome and along the y-axis is your significance level as a function of minus log 10 p-value. And this really will allow you to uh, localize associations within the genome to particular regions or areas. Now we do expect these peaks um, because you have, we've done imputation. So the imputation, right, relies on LD structure within the genome. And so we expect that um, SNPs nearby each other will um, have, uh, oops, will have uh, association evidence consistent with each other. So that's why you see these peaks here is because of the um, non-independence of the SNPs. Um, you can summarize individual regions through regional association plots. Um, so to kind of zoom into particular regions, here is uh, the CTP locus. Um, from the HDL GWAS, um, and you can see that there's um, this top variant is usually the reported variant in the paper, but there's many other associations um, that are uh, uh, significant within this loci. One thing to remember is that association is not causation. Um, the variants that we are analyzing can have a functional effect on the trait. It can cause an amino acid change that changes the protein. It could um, change a codon to a subcodon, or it could be a regulatory variant, so that changes the amount of protein produced. Or what you have to remember is that um, the variants may be an LD or a linkage disequilibrium with the functional variant. So we're not getting at the functional variants here, and we have to kind of do follow-up analyses to try and get at that. So there are many tools for performing genome-wide association studies, um, many of them that have been uh, developed like Plink and Eigensoft within um, the Broad, um, but uh, Plink is typically used for whole genome association analyses, um, Eigensoft for genetic principal component analyses, um, METAL is a popular tool for um, meta-analysis across um, genome-wide markers, and then Locus Zoom is to uh, create those regional association plots. So as I mentioned, um, genome-wide association studies have been um, been done over the last uh, 10 years. This was actually the seminal paper from the Wellcome Trust Case Controls Consortium. It was just published um, over 10 years ago. I believe it was published in June 2007. Um, and they looked at seven major diseases and did um, a GWAS for seven major diseases. And um, this was the first large scale uh, GWAS paper that was published. And since then, we've um, discovered a lot of loci associated um, across many traits. And um, there's lots that can be done um, beyond looking at your association between your outcome and SNP. And so I want to spend the last couple of minutes, or 20 minutes or so, uh, talking about different secondary analyses you can do. So things you can do are you can estimate the variants explained by a set of SNPs. Um, you can do fine mapping, where you look for independent or potentially causal SNPs within a locus. 
Um, you can check for pleiotropy. Does uh, the SNPs relate to um, other traits, related traits? Um, you could look for, um, use risk prediction, so create a score of your GWA variants and see if that predicts disease. Um, use Mendelian randomization to um, leverage genetic markers to get a causality of biomarkers on a particular outcome. And you could do pathway analyses um, and ask, are there associated loci linked within uh, biological pathways? And these are just some ideas of what you can do with uh, the GWA results, and there's plenty other things you can do. So I'm going to talk about each one of these. So estimating the variants explained by a set of SNPs, I'm going to do this by talking about the height GWAS. And so this is in a table from the 2014 height GWAS. And in 2014, they published a paper that had a GWAS of 253,000 samples, right? And they compared that to their previous um, publication where they had 130,000 um, individuals contributing to the height GWAS. So in the 250,000 sample study, they found about 700 significant SNPs uh, associated with height. Um, and that was uh, about three times more than they found with the 130,000 um, samples. Um, they then estimated the variants explained by the GWA significant SNPs. They also went deeper in the list and looked at SNPs that were marginally significant as well, and then did an all, all common SNP variants explained. And they found that, you know, with the GWA SNPs, they can explain 16% of the variation in heights. Um, when they went a little further and used the um, marginally significant uh, SNPs, they got uh, about up to about 30% and then got to about 50% when they used all common SNPs. And these variance explained um, estimates were done through a, a, GTC, a GCTA analysis, which is um, available in this software GCTA. Right. So um, it's, it, you can take your GWAS results and determine how much of the variation explained in that set of SNPs um, explains your, uh, the variation in your outcome. Um, fine mapping, we could look at what are the independent SNPs in the locus. Here's another example from the height GWAS. Um, and here they are looking at um, regional association plots um, from heights. And what they saw was that multiple signals uh, clustered uh, within this one gene, the NCAN gene, which, mean, which they point to then because the signals all t seem to cluster here within this one gene, that lends evidence that this is the, the gene that uh, is responsible in this region. Um, uh, Spain and Barrett in 2015 have this nice review in human molecular genetics about um, using fine mapping to identify causal SNPs in the locus. And doing fine mapping requires dense genotyping um, of that locus. Um, and so when you, after you have the uh, dense genotyping, there's two approaches you can take. If you just have summary statistics, you can use the summary statistics um, and uh, LD matrices with some software uh, such as Painter and Caviar to get um, the sets of most likely causal variants per uh, locus. Or if you have um, the, the raw data, you can do conditional association analyses to find independently associated signals and then calculate Bayesian posterior probabilities to get the most likely causal of variance per, per locus. And after you get this set of most likely causal variants per locus, um, you layer on functional annotation about uh, coding regions or regulatory uh, information from ENCODE and, um, and roadmap to find uh, target genes. And then you can move these to uh, functional experiments 
and, and look at the consequences of gene perberation. Um, pleiotropy gets at whether the SNPs are related to um, multiple traits. So here is an example from uh, the lipids GWAS, um, where we had 157 lipid loci identified, and we took the strongest associated SNP within each of those loci, and we looked up our 157 lipid SNPs in these other uh, seven traits. Um, uh, coronary artery disease, um, BMI, um, diastolic blood pressure, um, waist-hip ratio, systolic blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and fasting glucose. And so we took these 157 SNPs and looked them up in these other GWAS and looked for how much of an excess of the lipid SNPs are nominally associated at the 0.05 level for these other traits. And we found for all these other traits, there was a, um, an increase uh, excess than expected of the association between um, these SNPs and these other traits, indicating there's some effect of these lipid SNPs on these other traits as well. Um, here is an example of risk prediction. So does a score of genetic markers predict disease? So you can uh, create a genetic risk score, which is just a, um, a weighted sum of your um, SNPs by weights, and typically these weights are the betas from your um, genome-wide association study. So for each individual, you create a, a genetic risk score, and so that's like your new independent variable. Instead of each individual SNP, you have this score of SNPs across a, a set of SNPs. So in this uh, study, it was a Swedish prospective cohort study um, by Andrea Ghana, um, and it was published in 2013. They took um, about 10,000 Swedish part uh, participants that, and were looking at CHD, or coronary heart disease, as the outcome. And they took that, that they took three genetic risk scores here, um, an overall genetic risk score that um, encompassed 395 SNPs, um, a CHD-specific risk score that encompassed 46 SNPs, and then a, a polygenic risk score that um, captured a, a thousands of uh, SNPs. And they looked at this genetic risk score um, with uh, outcomes of CHD, BMI, HDL, systolic blood pressure, smoking, type 2 diabetes, and total cholesterol. Um, and they found that the genetic risk score, um, the overall genetic risk score, and the CHD genetic risk score associate with um, coronary heart disease status, um, as well as um, you know, the overall genetic risk score associating with um, HDL cholesterol, and you can see associations of these genetic risk scores with particular outcomes. They also did these um, trait-specific uh, genetic risk scores. So where uh, these SNPs that are encompassing the genetic risk score are particular for BMI. And what you can see here is that these um, SNPs that are particular BMI will uh, associate with the outcome of BMI. So you can use genetic risk scores as a new independent variable and look at um, outcomes against these SNPs that have been um, associated with, uh, with your, um, in your GWAS. The next example I want to give you is about Mendelian randomization, so leveraging genetic markers to get a causality of biomarkers. So um, Mendelian randomization is taking a uh, the concept that you're randomly segregating alleles at meiosis, um, and is similar to and can be thought of conceptually um, like a randomized clinical trial where um, people are randomized to treatment. Um, and so you have an expose that get the intervention and the control with no intervention, where um, when you have the random segregation of alleles, 
at meiosis, your exposed get an allele and the controls get the other allele. And um, this uh, takes into account that there's um, no confounders between the groups and so that we can compare the outcomes between the groups. So Mendelian randomization is supposed to be thought of like uh, controlled uh, randomized trials. Um, assumptions of Mendelian randomization is on the genetic markers have to be strongly associated with your exposure of interest. Um, there has to be um, uh, independent of the outcome given the exposure. And the genetic marker has to be independent of the factors that confound the exposure outcome relationship. So displayed visually that the um, genetic marker has to influence your biomarker of interest um, and only influence the outcome through your biomarker of interest. So there is a method um, that just leverages a, uh, your GWA association statistics to do these um, Mendelian randomization or instrumental variable analyses, which is the, the same term as uh, the same thing, different terminology, um, using multi-SNP genetic risk scores and summary statistics. And basically this is um, you get effects that are weighted effects of your um, effect estimates from your phenotype, uh, your, your biomarker to SNP, as well as your um, uh, SNP to your outcome that you want to test the causality on your biomarker, uh, on your outcome from your biomarker. Um, you can get um, genetically elevated effects of your, or genetically uh, modified biomarker effects on your outcome, and you can test this through this chi-square statistic. So an example of this is with uh, lipids. Um, so epidemiologically, um, both LDL cholesterol and HDL cholesterol are uh, associated with um, risk of uh, coronary heart disease, um, where LDL cholesterol um, is predicted um, by epidemiology to increase your risk of um, coronary heart disease, where HDL cholesterol, higher HDL cholesterol, you have a lower risk of coronary heart disease. But when we use genetic risk scores consisting of 13 LDL um, variants that have are specific to LDL cholesterol, and then 13 or 14 um, HDL specific SNPs, we find um, that in the instrumental variables, in the instrumental variables analysis, um, that the effect of a genetically increased LDL cholesterol um, is significantly associated with coronary heart disease. And the effect estimates are very similar to, or similar to what you see epidemiologically where um, for HDL cholesterol, when we look at genetically increased HDL cholesterol, it's not associated with um, a risk of coronary heart disease, indicating that, um, that HDL cholesterol may not be causal for um, coronary heart disease. Um, my last example is for pathway analysis. There's many types of um, pathway analysis software available. Um, three of them are Magenta, Grail, and Depict. All three of these have been developed by Brodies. Um, Magenta is a method designed to identify gene sets enriched in GWAS datasets. Um, Grail uses published literature to highlight connections between likely relevant genes within uh, GWAS identified loci. And Depict is a um, data-driven integrative measure, uh, method that uses gene sets to um, reconstruct uh, um, the basis of large-scale expression data to prioritize genes and gene sets. So um, these are um, Potential software you can use for pathway analyses. Um, an example from uh, the lipid GWAS is we use Magenta um, to evaluate the overrepresentation of biological pathways uh, among uh, associated loci. 
And among the 157 loci uh, that we found in that GWAS, um, Magenta identified 71 enriched pathways, and these pathways lended insight to some of the new genes that we had um, found in the GWAS and gave us some biological context for those genes. So in summary, um, GWAS have been very successful at locating regions of the genome that are associated with complex traits. Um, there are, many of the loci are um, non-coding with no gene function, so um, that is something that has to be worked on is how to follow up these genes or how to follow up these SNPs and find functional SNPs within uh, those regions. Um, there are more genetic variation to be found. Um, larger sample sizes have been shown to find more common genetic variants with subtler effects, such as what I showed in the height GWAS. Um, and most GWAS have been done in European samples, so um, there's a wealth of information in non-European individuals, um, and GWAS has been going in that direction. Um, and then I've also demonstrated that there are many types of analyses that can be done by, beyond the initial association study to follow up these results and not just look for a, a set of significant SNPs, but really get at some biological meaningful questions. So I'm happy to take any questions you have for the last uh, 10 minutes or so. Thank you. So um, the question is, is how to take into account population structure into a meta-analysis? And so how that typically is done is each individual study will account for the population structure within their study through the genetic principal component analyses. And then um, each, that would mean that each study is well controlled for population structure at that point, and then you just meta-analyze those results. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the question is, is um, do you want to use a fixed effects or random effects model, um, particularly when you have population structure, right? And um, there are some instances where a random effects model will be more appropriate, particularly when you have um, differences in the effect based on different populations that you're meta-analyzing. But if you can assume that the once you take into account the population structure between the samples, then a uh, fixed effects meta-analysis should most of the time be appropriate. But there has been demonstrated times when um, you would prefer to use a random effects model. Other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, and I'll be around if anyone has a question offline.